going to hear from this this month to learn. Uh, I'm going to see you a little bit later on throughout the day. I have to run to Minion now. Uh, but let me just say that uh, it's a true privilege uh, for us as a synagogue to be hosting all of these events. And I want to thank uh, really everybody who helped make this uh, possible, particularly the Canadian Institute for Jewish Research and Professor Grants. Thank you so much for everything that you do in the field of Jewish studies and having the wisdom to select such a useful and important topic for this uh, for this uh, day's study. Professor Grants, I turn it over to you. stepped in at a difficult moment, another venue which had been arranged, fell, we, I thought, had fallen through, and this synagogue came to the fore, stepped into the breach, and has been wonderful all the way through in terms of working with the Institute, CIJR, and uh, doing everything possible to make this day uh, a success. I appreciate it deeply, indeed. CIJR, uh, very, also very briefly, CIJR is an uh, independent academic uh, pro-Israel research uh, institute or think tank. We are headed in Montreal and we have a very active Toronto chapter. We are 30 years old, just about. We also now have a sister institution in Washington, D.C. called the American Institute for Jewish Research. The the task of CIJR is to use academic insert, uh, insight and knowledge uh, to defend uh, the Jewish state of Israel and the Jewish people in the community, both Jewish and non-Jewish, and to work uh, to represent the truth about Israel in the media, and above all, to work very closely with students. One of our most uh, important tasks is to 
support the students on campus, which is very difficult these days, as you, uh, I'm sure, know. And we have a wonderful group of students that publish their own journal called uh, the um, Dateline Middle East, which is now in its 28th year of consecutive publishing. That is a, a record for North America in terms of student, Jewish student publications. Um, they were quite active there in combating BDS on campus uh, and educating the students. And we have a program called Israel Learning Seminar, which we, is taking place here in Montreal, which tries to prepare students for the kinds of uh, confrontations and, and tensions which they are increasingly facing on our campuses. So CGR has a, a long track record. We have many publications. We have a daily briefing and email. We have a journal, uh, Israfax. Uh, we sponsor conferences. Everything we do, we do in order to bring to the public uh, an objective analysis of Israel in her difficult neighborhood. Before I say a few words about Emil, a, a few thank yous. One of them, of course, again, to Beth Tikva, to Rabbi Grover, to the wonderful board member here, Howard Price, who we have worked with very closely, uh, who's been extremely helpful, to Gail Kurtzman of the staff and, and other staff members here at Beth Tikva. We appreciate everything you've done. To my CIJR staff, thank you very much, a deep thank you. I'm doing this now because what happens at the end of the day, things get rushed and, and you never really get around to the proper thank you. So I've learned to do them at the beginning rather than the end. Uh, but our, our wonderful staff, headed by uh, Yuna Shapira, who you'll see flitting around organizing everything, and, and other staff members who are here, and to our superb board chairman, Jack Kinsler, who's with us today. Jack, can you stand up so people see you? Jack is here. And he's, he's played a, a very, very important role in, in making it possible for us to have today's conference. Uh, I want to thank in advance our wonderful uh, conferencier, as we say on the East Coast, our uh, panelists, our, our, our superb academics who, uh, who will be presenting to you in the course of the day. Uh, they were, have dedicated much of their work to uh, studying Emil and to teaching Emil and, and to keeping his work and his memory alive. Uh, to Kenneth Green and Cliff Orwin, a special note of thanks because they have been extremely helpful here. And um, also to Michael Morgan, who's with us, because uh, he is probably the leading student of Emil's thought, and, and a number of published works have really uh, made a tremendous impact. And uh, the la last one, which I highly recommend to you, is something he's an act of love that Michael edited the um, memoir, the autobiographical memoir of Emil Fagenheim, um, Epitaph for German Judaism, which at this point, if there's one thing that you have some time to read, I would read that uh, memoir, Epitaph for German Judaism. I'd like to thank also uh, Ailey Wiesel. You will see a short video from Ailey uh, in a few moments. He isn't well. He couldn't come here, he wanted to come here, but he insisted on at least being present through a, a video which he made and which we will show you in a few moments. And also, of course, I want to thank Rabbi Irving Yitz Greenberg, who uh, also stepped into the breach rather late and uh, responded wonderfully, an old colleague and friend of, of Emil and a wonderful man in his own right, as you will hear, great figure who will be giving the keynote speech uh, at our lunch break uh, today. So all of these people, all of these groups, institutions have made this possible. And a special note of thanks um, to Doris Epstein, who is a very well-known journalist here in Toronto and an active member of the CIJR Toronto chapter, and without whose intervention, this probably, the event would not have happened. Doris, stand up for a moment. Let's go. Doris had the inspired thought of bringing the possibility of the conference to Beth Tikva, and that's what led to where we are this morning. So we thank her. 
So we are here today to honor the, uh, the memory and the work of uh, a great figure of modern Jewish thought, Emil Fackenheim. And the key realization uh, is that that body of thought is of, which is expressed in many works, which will be touched on today, is still alive, still very much alive, um, still important, still throwing light on the reality that we face today. And as we meet here this morning, of course, Israel and the Jewish people, and indeed the Western world, are again in crisis. And Emil's words, written in 2000, before his passing, shortly before, are relevant uh, 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 today. I read, I read it to you. This is from the Epitaph for German Judaism. In 1967, the world community feared a second Holocaust, this time in Israel. Earlier, after World War II, it was clear that if Nazi Germany had won the war, it would have ruled the world and made it Judenrein free of Jews. But since Germany lost and reached its aim, which was the extermination of the Jewish people, only in part, the abyss exists, nevertheless, in at least three histories, the German, the Jewish, and the Christian. Three elements, three, three experiences, three national religious entities touched by the Holocaust. And he added in this, in this paragraph, he added in parentheses, and also the European experience, question mark. And one of the things we know today is that the very notion of Europe itself as a coherent Western civilization is up for grabs. It's part of the, the general crisis that we are facing. So Hitler, for Emil, treating the Jews as both vermin and devil via a, what he called the Nazi Weltanschauung, a Nazi worldview, Hitler not only murdered Jews, but he tried also to murder even Jewish martyrdom. Hadrian, who had destroyed Jerusalem in 135, common era, forbade the Jewish faith. Hitler and his minions forbade and sought to destroy Jewish life. We face today, a, again, a series of interlinked crises. Ongoing terrorism in Israel, some think perhaps the beginning of a third intifada. Terrorism across the Middle East, typified, expressed by the ISIS barbarians in Syria and in Iraq. Repeated Hamas rocket attacks on, on Israel, leading to two, two wars. A Europe, again, now uh, submerged by waves of Muslim immigration in deepening crisis. And as if all of this wasn't bad enough, an American administration which has inexplicably strengthened Iran, a vicious anti-Semitic regime, to the point where they may very well uh, obtain nuclear weapons in relatively short order. So Emil understood the uh, larger world historical crisis that he faced. We, we forget, but Emil had, had lived and experienced 9-11. Uh, and the second intifada, right, before he, he passed. He understood that Hitler's drive to exterminate the Jews called Western civilization into question. And that's partially why he engaged in Jewish-Christian dialogue, which was so important for him. Um, because he saw Christianity in, 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 in some ways as the extension of Judaism and, and an important world force to be defended. And nevertheless, despite 1933 to 1945, uh, he was optimistic. He had little confidence in Western civilization as such. 
but he did respect the great work of men like Churchill and for all his problems, FDR as well. But I wonder if Abel were with us what he would think of Great Britain today, let alone of the U.S. And that, I think, underlines the seriousness of the crisis that Israel and we, as Jewish people, are in. So insofar as uh, Judaism and the Jewish people are concerned, Emil's answer was no. Hitler had grievously wounded us, but he had not succeeded. And the horror and the terror was followed by a kind of miracle, the survival of Jews and Judaism, and then the recreation of the Jewish state, Israel, in 1948. So for Emil, Judaism, the Jewish people stand as what he calls the Jewish house against death. Judaism is about life. It's about choosing life. It is about continuing fighting, not giving in to despair. And hence came his famous, as we all know, 614th mitzvah, thou shalt not give posthumous victories to Hitler, the Jewish people, all men and women of goodwill must not engage in anything which weakens Judaism, the Jewish people, the state of Israel. The continuity of Judaism was for him a great and ongoing miracle. So Emil's work, let me conclude, Emil's work uh, is many things. It is philosophy, it is theology, it is history, and it is, I think, very importantly, a specific and, and Jewishly conscious politics. Part of what Emil was saying through his works was that Jews have to be political, but they have to be political by being true to the nature and the essence of, of, of Judaism. His work is also, and I think this is under, underestimated, uh, a, a wonderful literary corpus. Emil was a, a wonderful and powerful writer as well as speaker, and one can conceive of his entire work as a kind of midrash on uh, the larger problem of modernity. And all these strands will be analyzed today by my, my colleagues, so I, I needn't go on here. Uh, very importantly, I am so glad to see young people in the audience, students, we and Beth Tikva made a tremendous effort to get young people here to expose you to this wonderful, powerful body of thought. And I hope you will take courage from what you hear today uh, in relation to your own situation as students and young people, and particularly on our, our campuses. So we're all here today to learn from and through Emil and to express our deep respect, and for so many of us who are here, uh, who knew him, our affection for this brilliant, courageous, uh, and caring Jewish philosopher. He was a brilliant, caring, and courageous Jewish philosopher, and he was also a good and wonderful mensch, a human being, and anyone he touched was transformed by him. So I just want to conclude by saying, uh, in these difficult times, may his memory and his work and his example long be a blessing for us all. Thank you. Uh, uh, welcome to all. I'm Clifford Orwin, Professor of Political Science, Jewish Studies, and Classics at the U of T. Since the members of the panel far exceed me in Jewish learning, I assume that I was put in this position because I am a political scientist. I have the strictest orders to hold everyone to the time limits and to make examples of those um, who stray um, so as to uh, deter others from doing so. Though, given the experience of the members of the panel, I don't fear that as a likely possibility. So each speaker will speak for no more than 20 minutes, and after that we'll have about 15 minutes of discussion, during which you should also um, feel free to get coffee, since the discussion and the coffee break are simultaneous. So we have three very distinguished speakers, and I guess we'll um, have them simply in the order in which they're listed on the program. 
Uh, this would seem to be, above all, the panel on Fackenheim and philosophy, the Fackenheim's response and critique of previous philosophers. So our first speaker is Professor David Patterson, the Hill A. Feinberg Chair in Holocaust Studies at the Ackerman Center for Holocaust Studies at the University of Texas at Dallas, who is speaking on a Jewish philosopher's critique of philosophy, Emil Fackenheim's response to the Holocaust. Uh, Professor Feinberg. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Krantz, Professor Orwin. Um, why should the Holocaust be an occasion for examining philosophy? I mean, what, what does Athens have to do with Auschwitz? Um, the question itself is daunting, um, but it's a question that Emil Fackenheim, who was not only a profound thinker, but a courageous thinker, had the courage to, to pose. At the uh, June 1939 meeting of the National Socialist Association of University Lecturers, Professor Walter Schulze <coughs> made the following statement. <coughs> He said, what the great thinkers of German idealism dreamed of finally comes alive. Never has the German idea of freedom been conceived with greater life and greater vigor than in our day. Now, German idealism, of course, is the German philosophy that stems from the Enlightenment. Um, what exactly is the Enlightenment, anyway? Answering that question, Fackenheim uh, offers a brief quotation from Immanuel Kant, who dis defines the Enlightenment as man's release from his self-incurred tutelage. Tutelage is man's inability to make use of his understanding without direction from another. Self-incurred is this tutelage, says Kant, when, it, when its cause lies not in the lack of reason, but in the lack of resolution and courage. So if, you, if you're looking back through the history of philosophy, you're already hearing echoes of people like Walter Schulze. Um, now, what is, what is one of the most threatening things to uh, resolution, courage, and the, the autonomy of the thinker from the point of view of Kant is what is most essential to Jewish thought and Judaism, namely Torah, the revealed Torah, revealed commandment. So the elimination of revelation as a category of thinking becomes central to one's uh, self-liberation, self-emancipation. Therefore, Kant declared that the euthanasia of Judaism through, reason, uh, through the uh, elimination of revelation and uh, by reason, the, elim the euthanasia of Judaism is the pure moral religion. Now, Fackenheim understood quite well that revelation is a, a central category in Jewish thinking. He says that uh, if revelation is impossible, then there is no significance to the human situation, even though God or the idea of God is accepted. Um, so you see, revelation has to be eliminated in order to attain autonomy, where autonomy is understood as being self-legislating. Okay? So that instead of being defined by a divine commandment, for example, uh, the human being here is determinable, as Kant put it, only by laws which he gives to himself through reason. Once the human being is self-determining, of course, God becomes superfluous. Um, and as Fackenheim noted, if man was to be fully free in his world, God had to be expelled from it. The living God had to become a mere deity, a cosmic principle, remote, indifferent, and mute. Now, Fackenheim knew uh, something about Hegel. In fact, Fackenheim knew perhaps more than anyone knew about Hegel. But with Hegel, as, as you go in, in, the, in the, uh, the sequence of this philosophical development, with Hegel, Fackenheim says, uh, divinity comes to dwell in the same inner space as the human self, so that with the next step, 
to the, the neo-Hegelians, uh, such as Feuerbach, Marx, and uh, he names Ernst Bloch in this, the, the, identity, the identity of the divine nature and the human becomes the appropriation of the divine nature by the human. So that once again, uh, God is eclipsed by the human. The human becomes self-legislating, self self-determining until uh, ultimately, uh, Nietzsche pronounces God dead, or that is to say, irrelevant. Here in this, in, in this kind of sequence of modern thinking, the development of modern thinking, um, looking at this, Fackenheim describes modern thought as the hostile judge of Judaism. There can be no room for Jews as defined by Judaism in, in, such, a, in such a world. Um, therefore, like uh, Clermont de Tonnerre the, uh, the, his, and his famous statement before the French National Assembly in 1789, to the Jews, everything as an individuals, but nothing as a people. That is to say, nothing as a people apart, a, a covenantal people, a, a chosen people. But Fackenheim asks, in connection with uh, Clermont de Tonnerre's statement, who, who here was doing the granting and the denying? And of course, he answers, sovereign man. Uh, you have the emergence of the man-god here, man who determines good and evil, not just knowing good and evil, but determining good and evil. And when man becomes sovereign, ultimately, for the Jew, the bottom line is uh, assimilate. That is to say, it's, it's uh, elimination through assimilation. The, the Jew who is no longer part of a covenant is no longer a Jew. And of course, under the Nazis, uh, the bottom line is not you know, assimilate or die, but simply to die. Um, so here, looking at this history of, of, of thinking, Fackenheim notes that uh, ever since the Enlightenment, the denial of the living God, the God of Abraham, was an essential aspect of man's scientific and moral self-emancipation. If man, he says, was to be fully free, God had to be driven out of the world. And, the, and he goes on to say, the moment the existence of the living God became questionable, Jewish existence also became questionable. Um, here you begin to see uh, perhaps the meaning of, of, the, uh, of the teaching in Judaism that God, Torah, and Israel are one. To eliminate one requires eliminating the other two. So the Nazis' final solution is a philosophical solution. And uh, I think that that's a statement that can be uttered only in fear and trembling. It's not about sociology or psychology or ethnic difference. It's about a philosophical worldview, as Fackenheim understood. Um, he says, for example, if the national socialismus, national socialism, was the acting out of a Weltanschauung, the worldview, and if anti-Semitism was the granite-like core of it, then ne neither the Fuhrer nor his decent followers could be satisfied with a halbheit, a half measure. The solution of the problem posed by the Jewish poisoners of the world had to have ganzheit, that is, it had to be a final solution. It had to have the, the QED of a syllogistic demonstration. Um, it had to be total. What does it mean? It means that the Nazis, concretely, it means that you, for example, that the Nazis will go to Tromso, Norway, in the Arctic, to find the 17 Jews <laughs> dwelling above the Arctic Circle and kill them. This is not scapegoating. Um, it's not reducible to a case of racism run amok. It's not about xenophobia. It's not about envy. It has this metaphysical, philosophical dimension, as I think Fackenheim understood. Um, the Nazis were not anti-Semites because they were racist, he pointed out. They were racist because they were anti-Semites. 
okay? You, you don't have to go to the Arctic to find a scapegoat. It's not about that. It's not about ethnic differences. There's nothing in the Jew that, 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 that meets the eye that you should have eliminated. So uh, as uh, Alfred Rosenberg understood, the Nazi ideologue, that the, the German Geist is poisoned not just by Jewish blood, but by Judaism. You have to establish an anti-Semitic position in order to arrive at a racist position. Okay. Now, what does this mean? Fackenheim says that the, the Holocaust returns us philosophically to perhaps the most ancient of the philosophical questions, as old as Socrates, he said. What does it mean to be a human being? Now, the Nazis had one understanding of that. The Jews and Judaism have another understanding of that question, and the two cannot abide in the same universe. From a Nazi standpoint, a human being has value through a natural accident. You happen to be born an Aryan, as they understand Aryan. And if you're an Aryan, uh, you take on a greater depth and substance through a will to power, through resolution and courage, resolve, what Heidegger calls Entschlossen. Entschlossen. So, um, it's a triumph of the will here that, that distinguishes the Nazi triumph, not the triumph of the good or justice or spirit or anything like that. The Lenny Riefenstahl's film, Triumph of the Will. Right? From a Jewish standpoint, as, you, as we know, um, a human being has value not on the basis of anything that can be measured in nature or through any inner autonomy or inner resolve on the part of the human being himself or herself. A human being has value as an emanation of the Holy One. Um, therefore, the value of a human being has nothing to do with anything that is specific to a, a given situation. Like, you know, no matter how old, young, fat, thin, smart, dumb, etc., a human being has infinite value. Um, and first of all, secondly, every human being stems from one human being. Therefore, every human being is both physically and metaphysically connected to the other and ethically implicated in that connection. Why does uh, God start with one and not two, the rabbis ask? <clears throat> in, the, uh, in the Tosefta Sanhedrin, uh, they answer, so that no one can say to someone else, my side of the family is better than your side of the family. There's only one side of the family. Of course, you can see that this would be antithetical to Nazi thinking. A Nazi has no more connection to a Jew or a Slav than you have to an insect. Right. So um, that's, that's, the, that's the Jewish question. You know, what is the human being? Therefore, through Fackenheim's uh, Jewish response, Jewish philosophical response to a philosophical, tr philosophical tradition that had a contribution in paving the way to Auschwitz, takes us back to, uh, to the original questions put to humanity, the first question put to the human beings, where are you? And perhaps more immediately, uh, the two questions put to his firstborn. Where's your brother? And what have you done? I think this is a teaching uh, that comes to us from Fagenheim's critique of philosophy as a Jewish thinker, a Jewish philosopher in a post-Holocaust period. I, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, my topic is... Uh, a lecture Emma Fackenheim gave in the, to the Leo Beck Institute in New York in uh, 1969 on the 50th anniversary of the publication of the neo-Kantian philosopher Hermann Cohen's life culminating magnum opus, Religion of Reason Out of the Sources of Judaism. In praise of Cohen, who died the year before publication, Fackenheim says, Quote, none combined as first-rate a contribution to German culture with as forthright and unequivocal a commitment to Judaism as did Hermann Cohen. 
Fackenheim's praise is mixed with sorrow and regret, however. Quote, such was Cohen's trust in both these worlds and in their universal affinity, he adds, that he had no inkling or premonition that disaster was imminent, end quote. Like Gershom Scholem, whom he cites at the beginning of his lecture, Fackenheim rejects the notion of a German-Jewish symbiosis or fruitful intertwining of what Cohen called Germanism and Judaism. Fackenheim counters that German Jews, including Cohen, may have dreamed of or longed for such a symbiosis. But the disaster that was about to befall German Jews so soon after Cohen confirms that the non-Jewish Germans hardly shared that dream or that longing. Not surprisingly then, though it surprised me when I first noticed Fackenheim's lecture a few years later in its published form, Fackenheim spends more time showing what is wrong with Cohen's thought than what is right. <clears throat> he even starts by showing at length what is wrong before going on to what is right. So my own surprise came uh, from having been a student of Fackenheim's during the early 1960s here at University College without ever, or hardly ever, hearing him lecture on what is wrong in a philosophical thinker worthy of the name, unless he first gave due attention to what is right. The exception I seem to recall was Nietzsche. Perhaps I could try to explain why Fackenheim reverses his usual practice here by considering that his Leo Beck lecture addresses an audience marked by intimate memories of the obliterated hopes for any German-Jewish symbiosis at the hands of the non-Jewish Germans. But this would not account for the strictly philosophical dimension of Fackenheim's lecture. His taking pains to treat the philosophical element of Cohen's thought on its own terms. So my inclination to look to Fackenheim's immediate audience would therefore need some rounding out, as follows, perhaps. In 1965 or so, sometime before composing the Cohen Lecture, Fackenheim read the following in what he elsewhere describes as a great essay by his occasional informal mentor in philosophical and Jewish matters, Leo Strauss. I'm quoting, it's safer to understand the low in the light of the high than the high in the light of the low. In doing the latter, one necessarily distorts the high, whereas in doing the former, one does not deprive the, the low of the freedom to reveal itself fully for what it is." End quote. In a subsequent lecture on Leo Strauss and modern Judaism, however, Fackenheim demurs. Quote, this is Fackenheim. It seems to me that there are limitations here. The limitation is that there is one low that cannot be understood or does not fully reveal itself if looked at from the standpoint of the high. That low is Nazism and especially the Holocaust. So Fackenheim's demurral is that Strauss's dictum, quote, it's safer to understand the low in the light of the high, or in Fackenheim's rendering, or rewording, from the standpoint of the high, in the light of the high, in the light of the high, from the standpoint of the high, has a limitation when it comes to trying to understand the Holocaust. However this all may be, the same limitation seems to me to be at work in Fackenheim's thoughtful assessment of what is right and wrong, or rather wrong and right, with the philosopher Herman Cohen. So my subsequent remarks on Fackenheim's reversal of his usual approach to philosophical thinkers when it comes to Cohen uh, are motivated by the question, well, what remains of or for philosophy as such here in the light of Fackenheim's demurral? I need to wait to face this question till after considering what he says about Cohen. So he makes four points about Cohen. One, Cohen's World War I patriotic pamphlet titled Germanism and Judaism suffers from a lack of realism. Two, the same lack of realism shows up in Cohen's overall deviation from Immanuel Kant, 
whose philosophy Cohen was preeminent in renewing among German professors of philosophy. Three, nevertheless, Cohen, quote, regains the contact with reality, which thus far, that is in Fackenheim's uh, exposition, seems wholly lost. By, quote again, building Jewish moral and religious commitments into Kantianism itself. And in four, ultimately, <clears throat> Inasmuch as Judaism in Cohen's posthumously published magnum opus, quote, remains in its own context even as it is transformed into a religion of reason, what may be called a reality principle has appeared in Cohen's Jewish thought, which was wholly absent in its earlier phase. <clears throat> Let me say more on each of these four points. First. How does Cohen's lack of realism show up in his Germanism and Judaism pamphlet? Fackenheim calls attention to Cohen's all too dubious idealizing, both of what is quintessentially German and of what is quintessentially Jewish. Both, says Cohen, are rooted in ethical idealism. What's quintessentially German is said to originate in the Protestant Reformation which Cohen characterizes as, and these are Fackenheim's words, quote, a revolution in behalf of free inward conscience, a conscience as much moral as religious, end quote. <clears throat> this revolution, Cohen adds, soon found expression in German philosophy and poetry, above all in Kant and Schiller, and notably in their teaching as regards an historical future of peace, socialism, and internationalism, which in turn would come about only with due recognition of the moral autonomy of all human individuals. As for what's quintessentially Jewish, Cohen locates it in the messianic expectation inherent in Judaism's biblical sources and identical with those same ideals of peace, socialism, and internationalism as expressed in German philosophy and poetry. And here, Cohen adds, that although those ideals have been dormant since Jews' ghettoization in post-biblical times, up to and including the time of Moses Mendelssohn, Mendelssohn himself opened his fellow Jews to Germanism and made it, quote, a life force for Judaism, that's Cohen, so as to enable German Jews to be and again, this is Cohen, as Germans, Jews, and as Jews, Germans, end quote. So what does Fackenheim find wrong here? Some of the German patriotic excess to be seen in Cohen's pamphlet is excusable, Fackenheim allows, especially since others' excesses were worse, and since Cohen himself was never, and again, Fackenheim's word, guilty of assimilationist cowardice. Even so, Fackenheim wonders how Cohen could so complacently overlook the anti-Jewish sentiments voiced by such quintessentially German figures as Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Wagner, and of course Luther. In a passage Fackenheim quotes at length, Cohen admits that despite Jews having, according to his argument, deeper spiritual roots in Germany than their fellow Jews have elsewhere, German Jews' road to political equality, quote, again, Cohen, is harder and more erratic than elsewhere, notably in France. To Fackenheim's chagrin, however, Cohen offsets that admission, or tries to, by adding that German Jews' harder road to political equality is, quote, Cohen again, of higher value for religious survival, end quote. This passage, comments Fackenheim, so indescribably tragic in retrospect, gives us our first clue to a fatal flaw which permeates Cohen's entire thought, a strange abstractness, a shadowy sort of idealism, which ascribes to ideas and ideals far greater power and responsibility than they ever can carry, end quote. Characterizing Cohen's fatal flaw as a, quote, dreamlike unrealism, end quote, 
Fackenheim goes on to locate it as well in Cohen's overall Kant interpretation. The second then, Fackenheim contrasts the dreamlike unrealism of Cohen's Kant interpretation with Kant's own realism. Let me quote a Kantian passage that Fackenheim has in mind. Quote, this is Kant now. The problem of organizing a state, however hard it may seem, can be solved even for a race of devils. The problem is, given a multitude of rational beings requiring universal laws for their preservation, but each of whom is secretly inclined to exempt himself from them, to establish a constitution in such a way that although their private intentions conflict, they check each other, with the result that their public conduct uh, is the same as if they had no such intentions. As Fackenheim points out, central to Kant's overall argument and Cohen's is the view that moral duties as such are entirely distinct from the natural inclination to consider the happy or unhappy consequences of one's actions, even though Kant also sees indifference to consequences as, in Fackenheim's words, an existential impossibility. Nevertheless, Kant has eschatological expectations, or in Cohen's language, messianic ones, for human history. Historically, comments Fackenheim, Kant looks to a future of perpetual peace, but his hope is as much grounded in a grim political necessity, which will compel even the worst of men as in an exalted moral necessity, which will compel the best of them. The difference between Kant and Cohen here is that Cohen drops the need to take into account the grim political necessity that Fackenheim calls attention to in Kant's account. Fackenheim elaborates as follows. Whereas Kant considers human nature, though not human will, to be unalterable, <coughs> Cohen speaks of recreating man in accordance with the idea of humanity. Whereas Kant holds that moral progress requires the cooperation of natural necessity, Cohen, again in Fackenheim's words, stakes his whole faith on the moral education of the human race. And whereas Kant views the good or moral will as one but not the only end for human beings, Cohen says the good will alone is the final end. Third, however, Fackenheim concedes that Cohen does not entirely lose touch with reality in facing the difficulty bequeathed by Kant. The difficulty, as Fackenheim sees it, is this. If, as Kant argues, all moral actions, to be moral, must be autonomous or done entirely for their own sake rather than for their consequences, even or especially if those consequences included one's own and or others' happiness, and even or especially if the happiness were fully deserved, then how can moral expectations be applicable to human beings as they are historically? That is, as creatures guided by self-regarding inclinations as well as by moral demands. Here, says Fackenheim, Kant himself can only say, if somewhat unclearly or unconvincingly, that the happiness owed to human beings who deserve it that is, who are morally virtuous, can only come about by means of an eschatological outcome in and as a result of history. And yet at the same time, this outcome must ultimately be a gift of God. Kant's unclarity here, according to Fackenheim, is in his speaking of God as an idea. Whereas, as Fackenheim points out, for God to be uh, effective in bringing about an eschatological end, he must be an existing God, not just an idea. In contrast, Fackenheim finds Cohen more forthright in saying that to solve the difficulty left by Kant, philosophy, quote, must borrow and absorb from a reality alien to it, by which Cohen means, as he calls it, prophetic messianism. True, as Fackenheim points out, Cohen is forced to modify the traditional Jewish belief in the messianic future taught by the prophets by arguing instead 
that progress toward history's messianic goal can come about only through human labor and not also by humans waiting patiently for the Messiah to be sent by an existing God when men have become good enough to make his coming possible or wicked enough to make it necessary. And here Fackenheim cautions that Cohen's God, like Kant's, remains an idea, the idea or ideal that inspires and empowers the human will with the overarching thought that the infinite moral demands placed on humans are progressively, though not exhaustively, fulfillable. Although Fackenheim adds that being indebted to, if not fully expressive of, Judaism's existing God, Cohen's God idea can be no mere idea. Fackenheim says more on this point in his concluding remarks. Fackenheim concludes his assessment of what's right and wrong, or real and unreal, in Cohen's thought, by citing the respective judgments of Franz Rosenzweig and Martin Buber. Rosenzweig predicted that Cohen's religion of reason out of the sources of Judaism, quote, will still be alive when one day his philosophical system will have gone the way of all systems. With Rosenzweig, Fackenheim notes that although 50 years since Cohen's death have seen philosophical systems fall into disfavor, at least one fragment of Cohen's system survives, namely his concept of correlation. Cohen's term for what Rosenzweig and Buber speak of instead as an I-thou relationship between human beings and God. Like Buber, however, Fackenheim stops short of holding with Rosenzweig that with the concept of correlation, Cohen, quote, breaks through the circle of idealism. The issue here is whether Cohen can account for the full range and depth of human relationships or humanly experienced realities between human beings and God in terms of thanks, the idea, uh, in terms of the idea of God, without reducing them to pale abstractions. Fackenheim quotes Cohen as doing just that as regards love of God. Quote, how can one love an idea, asks Cohen, who answers to Fackenheim's evident dissatisfaction, quote, how can one love anything except an idea? Even in sensuous love, one loves only the idealized person, only the idea of the person. The idealized person, Fackenheim implies, is not the individual person as such. In the end, therefore, Fackenheim sides with Buber, who speaks of Cohen as, quote, a great example of the philosopher who's overwhelmed by faith, having, again, quote, this is Buber, objectified the results of having been overwhelmed philosophically and incorporated them into his system of concepts. Two more thoughts here. One, Buber here speaks somewhat disparagingly. Second thought, same thought. For Fackenheim, as for Buber, Cohen's abstract system bespeaks Jewish faith without adequately articulating the humanly experienced realities addressed by Jewish faith. I taught it for a number of years. At a personal level, uh, I can report that the last Shabbat meal that he ate in Toronto while visiting his good friends Ralph and Kitty Wintrow today uh, was at my table. Uh, he went to our home and he, he looked in excellent health at the time and about six months later I believe he passed away in, in, in Jerusalem. Uh, and as for teaching his thought, his thought is uh, engaging, profound, and a challenge to uh, any serious person. However, I must admit I have a problem with Emil Fackenheim's thought. Uh, and the problem I would like to illustrate in the following way and uh, indicate its kind of zitzim leben, where it, it lies in, in history. I teach a course at the University of Toronto every third year or so called Philosophical Responses to the Holocaust. And one of the main uh, readings in that course is Emil Fackenheim's book, the book that he wrote just before he made Aliyah to Israel, to mend the world, Foundations of Future Jewish Thought. Student once came to me and said, uh, I'm having tremendous difficulty understanding the book. And I said, well, the reason, I think you're, one of the reasons you're having difficulty understanding the book 
is that it's basically written in German with a few English words and some English syntax. Uh, and I say that because I think one has to understand Emil Fackenheim as fundamentally a German philosopher, steeped in the German philosophical uh, tradition, uh, who very philosophical interests moved him in a direction to become a seriously Jewish thinker. He's always, he was always a serious Jew, and Jewish thought was always part of his thinking, but I think that this was the, uh, uh, the context in which he made that move. Now, to be a serious uh, German philosopher in the 20th century meant that one had to engage the thought of the most important German philosopher of the 20th century, probably the, maybe the most important philosopher in the West in the 20th century, uh, Martin Heidegger. And how interesting it is that Heidegger, who revolutionized philosophical thought in Germany and beyond, in the 1920s, virtually all of his students were Jews, with the one exception, perhaps, of Hans-Georg Gadamer, an important philosopher and died at the age of 101 a few years ago. But when it, one looks at the Jewish students of Heidegger, Hannah Arendt, Emmanuel Levinas, Karl Löwit, Hans Jonas, and Leo Strauss, all of whom went on to distinguish philosophical careers, and all of them, in one way or another, had to, as I would put it, come out from under Heidegger. And at the famous debate at the Swiss resort of Davos in 1928, the debate between, I would say, the philosophical Jew, not necessarily Jewish philosopher, philosophical Jew, Ernst Kassirer, and Martin Heidegger, which, by the way, is uh, uh, captured in a brilliant book by Professor Peter Gordon of Harvard University. Ernst Kassirer, who was considered to be, and Hermann Kohn, whom we just heard about, considered him to be his philosophical heir, as he considered Leo Beck to be his theological heir. The debate between Aaron Scassier representing what was called the old thinking and Heidegger representing the new thinking. The Jews there, who were either there in person or there in spirit, all of them sided with Heidegger. And in fact, the great Jewish philosopher whom Emil Fackenheim wrestled with continually, Franz Rosenzweig, then in the terminal stages of his life, because he was suffering from what we call ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease, sent a message when he found out about the debate, siding with Heidegger. Now at that particular point, Heidegger did not seem to be an anti-Semite, and Heidegger did not seem to be a follower of, at that time, the very minuscule Nazi movement in Germany. But when in 1933, Martin Heidegger, as the rector of the University of Freiburg, delivered the famous or the infamous Rector Rede, his address as the rector of the university, which is quoted verbatim in uh, 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 To Mend the World, beginning on page 167, if anybody's taking notes, where he announced that Adolf Hitler was the only entire law and standard and that everything was to be measured against the will of the Fuhrer. You can imagine how this hit all of these Jewish students who had been so captivated by Heidegger, and, and rightly so. Heidegger was a true genius. Even though Karl Jaspers pointed out to his student Hannah Arendt that Heidegger, who was known even then as the Zauberhaus Meskirch, the sorcerer of Meskirch, that was the town he came from, and warned her, he said, Heidegger is a greater philosopher than I am. 
but warned her about any involvement, whether philosophical, and we know her involvement with him was much more than philosophical. But all of them had to, somehow or other, indicate how they were to come out from under Heidegger, whom all of them, I think, felt a tremendous sense of personal betrayal. Karl Levitt did it by a return to the thinking of Franz Rosenzweig. Emmanuel Levinas basically indicated that where Heidegger went wrong was in the notion of mitzvah, the notion of being with others, and therefore that's where the foundation of philosophy lie. Hannah Arendt, as we well know, uh, basically apologized for Heidegger, indicated that he was some kind of uh, Luftmensch, who was a deep philosopher, but a political the naive. And that would have even been shocking, even if later on had not known the nature of their personal relationship. And Hans Jonas, in a moving article that I read in 1965, it was referred to me by my late revered teacher, Abraham Joshua Heschel, Zichon Alivracha, in a moving article in the Journal of Metaphysics, described coming back to Germany in 1945 with the British forces and making a decision, an Entscheidung, as they would say, a great decision, not to visit his former teacher, whom he never names my name, but everybody knows whom he's talking about, and instead choosing to visit, as he put it, a really second-rate philosopher a Kantian, but somehow or other someone who was able to at least engage in what was called inner exile, somehow not cooperating with the regime. So all of them, had a, in one way or another, had to come out from under Heidegger, and in, in my estimation, the most successful coming out from under Heidegger was Leo Strauss, who was a teacher of mine, even though one can have, difficult, have diff problems with, with his thought. And the one who I think did it the least effectively was, was Hannah Arendt, for not only personal reasons, but philosophical reasons as well. And therefore, when one sees this situation, and when one sees that Emil Falkenheim, who was not a student of Heidegger, because he was a child at the time, uh, but actually, that in To Mend the World, a book which is dedicated to the memory of Leo Strauss, it is clear that Fackenheim is engaging Heidegger's thought in a way that might be more profound than any of his actual students. And of course, he's engaging the thought after what has been revealed, what was known in Lenry, the, the post-war denials of and in fact, he says here on page 166 of To Mend the World, exalting as it does a historicity more concrete than an abstract temporality. In other words, Heidegger was very much emphasizing that there are points in history when there's an erikeness, when there's an event, when there's a showing of being, as he said. And the question is how one responds to, how one decides how to relate to that. Historicity more compared than absolute temporality, Heidegger is being in time points to actions of great moment that are not in mere time, but rather in history, but what other than having the characteristic of authentic decisiveness and scheidung, these actions ought to be or will be the work cannot say, talking about his great work, Sein and Sein, being in time. This was the condition of Heidegger's thought when his own folk, as the German people, made a fateful decision, and when the ontological thinker Heidegger made an ontic decision, that is something that in the real world, of great consequence, the only such decision he was to make during his whole life. Now what it seems to me that Fackenheim was doing is basically accepting the fundamental premises of Heidegger's thought. And in fact, in this section of To Mend the World, I have found, 
probably the most astute and profound analysis of Heidegger's thought written by anybody. Where Fackenheim differs sharply from Heidegger is what is the response to the Arrakis. The event is the Holocaust, the rise of Nazism and everything that came with it. And whereas Heidegger's response was a response of complicity, of basically allowing it to be what Heidegger called Seinlassen, letting it be, the response should have been, should have been one of a decision of resistance. It should have been a decision of resistance of the German people. And Fackenheim is very clear to praise those few Germans who dared risk to, to dare their lives to resist the regime. It had to be a response of Christians. And, Heide and, and, and uh, Fackenheim celebrates very much the response of such people as, as Kamen Lichtenberg in, 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 in Berlin, who prayed on behalf of the Jews and met his death because of it. And the decision of the Jews themselves not to cooperate with their persecutors. And the whole treatment of the Muslim men or the, the, the Muslims, ironically enough, the people kind of walking like we would call zombies today in the camps who had, who had given in rather than those who resisted. Now I would say that Wagenheim took a tremendous chance in terms of saying that basically he agreed with the premises of Heidegger's thought, but that Heidegger himself personally, because the decision always has to be personal, not abstract, made a profoundly wrong decision, a wrong decision that has to be overcome by Germans, as the wrong decision by Christians, as the wrong decision by, by Jews who cooperated with the regime, or, or at least cooperated in, in their own uh, extinction. This is a tremendous chance. And I often wonder whether uh, it succeeded. It seems to me that Heidegger is an example of a type of thinking that the type of thinking itself has to be overcome and not simply indicating that the response that it elicited or the response that it made was the wrong response. In other words, it's agreeing with somebody's premises but disagreeing with the conclusions, the personal conclusions that they uh, drew from that. And I think that this is uh, a problem that I have with uh, the, the thought of, of, of Professor Fackenheim, but certainly one that has to be taken seriously. I think it has to be taken seriously because what his important contribution was is that personal decision in the face of great evil is one of existential significance and therefore is not something that can simply be, well, I don't agree with the premises and therefore I, I, I draw another conclusion. And in that I uh, find much to, uh, to agree with. But I think that at the end of the day, uh, the man that he dedicated this book to, Leo Strauss, was more successful in overcoming uh, or attempting to overcome the baneful influence of the thought of Martin Heidegger. Thank you. Uh, David, I, I hope it's okay to admit that I don't really know that essay particularly well, but, but let me see if I can raise a, an issue with it that I think goes to the heart of what Fackenheim is about. Um, it, it's something like this, and this is another way of saying what, what prompted me to think about the, the Cohen lecture. Uh, it, it's very important for, for Fackenheim personally, but for his understanding of the drift of thought that he inherits German philosophical thought emphatically, I think, as uh, Rabbi Novak is pointing out. But the, the drift of thought in the West, I mean, he's confronting, I think as you also nicely pointed out, the philosophic tradition, what's happened to it, and what needs to be confronted 
well, as a Jew for the sake of Judaism, but as an academic for the sake of the nobility, the integrity, the dignity of philosophical thought. I mean, both these things are, are, are always going on at the same time. And so one, one could wonder this. When you read Fackenheim, I mean, to, I emphatically agree with what David was saying. He writes so engagingly. Yes, he writes in German. Uh, it's sort of like an, in, uh, reading Kafka and realizing that you sort of have to translate it back into English as you're reading the English. Uh, but it's wonderful, and, and in my case, it helps you write English. But it's something like this. Philosophical thought, philosophical suppositions, let's just say, are so embedded in the way he writes, in the way he thinks through philosophical issues, but especially Jewish issues, that one has to wonder, well, wait a minute, is it possible to sort these out? To what extent is he talking about real life in the terms of real life, to, use, to express myself a little bit in the way he might, and to what extent is he maybe overly guided by the philosophic tradition? I, I'm not happy with the way I just put the question, and I'll conclude by sort of excusing myself and, and pointing to what I think Fackenheim has in mind as a Hegel scholar. And it's something like this. There's a, a sentence or a short uh, sort of passing passage in the Phenomenology of Mind, Hegel's sort of introduction to philosophy, in the, either the introduction or the preface, I've forgotten, introduction, I think, where he says, you know, in ancient times, I'm paraphrasing, uh, thought, philosophical thought, people who began to philosophize were naive in the sense that, not that they were stupid, but they didn't presuppose a long, sophisticated tradition that moderns inherit and sort of start with, as a, almost as a matter of fact, the abstract form is ready-made, is the way Hegel puts it. So one, and I'm, I'll finish putting the question just this way and see if there are other responses. Fackenheim, it seems to me, is confronting modern thought as someone, in a sense like you or me, who's confronted with it, whether or not we had the advantage or disadvantage of studying in universities and reading uh, well-written German textbooks, among others, or philosophy books. That is our starting point, and so the difficulties that Fackenheim is pointing out about philosophy in particular are, in a way, the same difficulties differently expressed that we modern educated people face in trying to think through who we are, who Jews are, what they're about, what they should be doing. I'll just see if, that, if you think that's a fair comment. So what is the, the connection between the, the biological being of the Jew and the, the, the thinking, the teaching, the tradition that you find in Judaism? Uh, it's an excellent question. Um, this connection, the connection lies in what Nazis such as Alfred Rosenberg uh, referred to as Rassenzela, or race soul. Um, but this the Nazi notion of race is not like what we in North America think of race, where race is mainly a matter of color. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not this metaphysical category. So as uh, Rosenberg explained, the, uh, the, the term race is a synonym for character, soul, and thought. Therefore, the Judaism is like a contagion. Even if uh, you know a, a Jew rejects Judaism, Rosenberg explains he's still he's still prone to think Talmudically. In other words, the disease is still in the blood. So you have to track down every case of contagion, like you're tracking down every case of AIDS. And indeed, it isn't for nothing that they use the, meta the medical metaphor very frequently in the discourse vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Jews, uh, the Nazi, the equivalent of the AMA, the American or the Medical Association, did articles on the Jewish contagion. So the, the physical has this metaphysical aspect. Uh, Zalman Cole. Thank you. 
Judaism looks at, and that's the idea of revelation and God and and the divine in, in thought and, and, and the importance of that as well, um, and the fact that you can't really, uh, I guess, disconnect the two. Um, so, as a Jew, how how you know in the in modern times, how is one to to uh, I guess reconcile both those ideas uh, on the one and the importance of, of of your own thought and the other hand the importance of uh, you know keeping to the tradition. And, Another excellent question. Um, for the German idealists, such as Immanuel Kant, autonomy is understood in terms of self-legislation. In other words, um, it's through my reason that I generate a, a moral principle, uh, that I understand what the, good, what the good is, and that I can attain the idea of the good the, you know, through reason. Uh, from a Jewish standpoint, uh, it's not that I, am, I have no autonomy, if that means no free will. Well, I do, I am in a position to choose. However, uh, from a Jewish standpoint, I don't choose the good. The good chooses me, commands me, summons me, asks me, where are you? Where's your brother? What have you done? And it's in the light of that being chosen that I now have to make a choice. Uh, that already being chosen is what makes my choices matter. It's not like choosing vanilla or, or chocolate in an ice cream parlor, right? It matters what I choose uh, because I have been singled out from on high before I make any decision. Um, with the, 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 uh, the autonomy of German idealism, there's no singling out from, from beyond. It's all in the thinking ego. Nobody's asking where are you or where's your brother except my own autonomous, rational mind. Uh, Professor Novak, uh, I don't fully understand why you can't separate the man, Heidegger, from uh, his belief. Uh, in this sense, is that his whole notion of being is surely you know, so insightful and so dramatic his actions, of course, following, or his own understanding of what he, he himself said, of course, is questionable, not only questionable, but it should be dismissed. Why can't you entertain the idea of that separation? Well, of course, one, one could say that, but the, 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 point, the point is that even if, uh, and, and, and Fackenheim himself, argues that even though Heidegger's political actions did not logically follow in a necessary sort of way from his philosophical premises, nonetheless, there was nothing in them that could resist, the resistance that he calls for, what emerged as the Ereignis, as the event, which has been the rise of, of National Socialism, specifically uh, uh, Hitler. Um, so in that way, this is, is the I think the problem, uh, the problem is that Heidegger's thought, and I don't accept the notion that Heidegger's thought of it being is, is, is all that compelling. Uh, even if Heidegger had not been a Nazi, even if Heidegger had not been a Nazi, I think that building a philosophy of resistance on Heidegger's premises is still problematic, irrespective of the fact now, clearly, Heidegger's Nazism, I think, is what caused his Jewish students to realize that they had to reassess not only the, the, the facts, but the premises as well. Uh, but in that way, this is what I find uh, problematic uh, philosophically. It's much more a, uh, a, a difference of opinion ad rem to the matter rather than uh, ad hominem, whether Heidegger was a Nazi or not. And in fact, uh, Professor Michael Wishagrad, who used to be my chairman when I taught philosophy at the City of the University of New York, uh, who was one of the first to introduce Heidegger to English-speaking readers in his doctoral dissertation on, on, on Heidegger and Kierkegaard, uh, pointed out that one could derive from Heideggerian uh, premises opposite philosophical uh, conclusions. But I think the problem is with, 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 with the premises. And I'm not tainting uh, 
uh, background the Sahara, how could he possibly, you know, uh, be so involved with, with, with the Nazi? I think the problem is philosophical, uh, and I think that there are much better I would just like to ask, why did Martin Heidenberg choose to follow Hitler? And what, was he intimidated? Why did he choose? After all, he was a philosopher. He was a clever man, and yet he chose the wrong path. And okay. any commentary on that, please? Your, your name, ma'am? Faye, Faye Ingrid. Okay. Um, there, you know, there's, now there's probably a, a book a week now that comes out about Heidegger. Um, and there are two basic interpretations of Heidegger. One interpretation, uh, which seems to be the predominant interpretation, which I myself presented uh, in an article in 1985 called Uber's Critique of Heidegger, is that the Rektorreiter, the, 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 the address of the rector, directly comes out of Sein and Sight being in time, that all of the key terms there are directly already laid down in the philosophy. That's one interpretation. The other interpretation, and it might be Heidegger as a divided person, is that to a certain extent, Hannah Arendt and some others' interpretation of him is the, her famous remark, the banality of evil. There's also letters where Heidegger is convinced he's going to get a bigger pension and that he's going to be the court philosopher of the, of the Nazis. The Nazis quickly tired of him, uh, and whatever, which is something he played up very much after, uh, uh, after the war. Um, so in that sense, you know, the, but most of the opinion now is, is that Heidegger knew exactly what he was doing uh, and saw the event being the rise of National Socialism and therefore something that was, that his views on the, of being showing itself, the Aletheia, the, uh, uh, the, the showing, the uncovering of, of, of being was the, you know, the fact But as I say, the, the, the point that I, I wanted to make is that even if, even if you accept the notion that he was banal, that uh, Hanalak was some kind of pol political Luftmensch, you know, he didn't know what he was doing, uh, he was naive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the fact is that the premises of his philosophy are not so self-evident. And the premises of, of his philosophy, I think, are philosophically problematic, uh, and uh, I don't think that uh, Hermann Cohn in the in the person of Ernst Kassir was actually defeated at Davos. 